Hello, everyone, and welcome back. It's been a minute since I did a clinical one. We've been doing a lot of lectures for the residents, so I thought this would be kind of fun. Starting off, you can see that the x-ray shows a really shallow composite. Patients having pain in the upper left-hand area. A little tough to see why. Looking at the scan, you can see there's that big finding in the sinus with a palatal root going up inside there. Nothing super obvious with the buckles, but check out that mesial marginal ridge fracture. That's how the bacteria got inside there and caused this tooth to be necrotic. It did not not respond to cold, which is not a surprise here. So let's go ahead and treat this one. Starting off, take it out of the bite. Super important here because you've already cracked the tooth. She's already had you know, some trauma to the area, and we don't want it to crack further. In a case like this, for sure it needs a crown. That's why this tooth died in the first place. So take the tooth out of the bite as your first step. Then we're going to be removing the composite. Now I'm not going to remove all of it, but I will remove more than I would need necessarily for like an access. And that is so I can see how bad is the crack. Sometimes it'll look, you know, on that mesial marginal ridge, it's not too terrible. You remove the composite and all of a sudden you see, oh God, this is really bad. It's completely through the tooth. The tooth is split in half, and that gives you an idea of the severity of the fracture. Thankfully here, it really wasn't that bad. You can see the staining. I'm assuming there was an amalgam in this at one point, just based on the color there and the fact that it does have a fracture. And thankfully, the crack was pretty shallow. It didn't actually even drop down inside the chamber. Still not sure how bacteria got inside there, but this thing was definitely dead. There's no doubt about that. It did need the root canal. And so I dropped down, started to see a little bit of spots, but can't get anything with the eights. See. So we're going to go back in with that workhorse. This time I'm going to be without water, just gentle brush strokes. And I know we've talked about this in the access video. I like finding the mesials first. I don't know why I'm weird like that. A lot of people will go for the palatal. There's nothing wrong with that, but I tend to go after the mesials and that's what I'm doing here. You can see the nice thing with having the suction there, having the air there with the assistant is that it really, all the dust and stuff just kind of blows out and it's much easier to see where I'm looking for it. And so I've already found a couple little spots that look like they're going to be where the MB and MB2 are. I'm starting to work towards the palatal right now. Palatal actually was pretty wide open. Um, that's not a surprise there. Right there is our MB2. There's our MB1. And didn't really quite get into anything on the distal, but with those three being open, that's enough that I can start the process. I'll start off with the palatal wide open. You can see it drops down just beautifully with that 2006. No surprise there. It is the largest canal, and you can see it pretty obviously on the comb beam. Going in now with the MB1. It did buckle a little bit there, and the tooth is calcified, so that's not surprising that it stressed out the file a little bit, but I'm only really using this in the first few millimeters anyway, so, and then I'm going to peck around where the distal buckle is, and I actually picked it up nicely, so sometimes that AC won't get inside there. You can actually use your rotary file as like a, in a pecking motion, and that will often open up the canals really nicely. So we're using Triton here. I had thought about potentially doing the gentle wave, but the drainage really wasn't that bad. The, so I didn't really think it was going to add a ton here. You could, doesn't matter. I mean, if, if you really love the gentle wave, go for it. If you don't, don't. Uh, I think this is, it doesn't really add too much uh, to this case. So at this point, we found all four canals and we're going to start getting the working length here. I did speed it up. I, I feel like every time I talk over the working length, it's just as me rambling. <laughs> so this is at three times speed. I've shown this in many videos. If you guys need a primer on how to do the working length, let me know. If this is your first time watching, welcome. But pretty much take it down until it goes into the red, back it up until it's at the zero, zero, and and that's your working length. Ta -da. And so these were all right around that 17 mark, give or take. And so I'm going to measure this out with my 1704 and take that down. The distal buckle actually opened up for being so hard to find. It was very easy to do. <laughs> you can see the MB still giving me just a little bit of trouble there as I'm dropping down a uh, little bit of buckling with it. And a lot of you have asked how much pressure I'm giving. It's just enough so that the file is about to start buckling. So you can practice this by taking file, put it on the table, and push down until it starts to buckle. That's how much pressure I'm giving. It's actually not that much. People think I'm like really pushing hard. You don't want to push hard with rotary files whatsoever because that increases your risk of canal transportation, of separating the file, of all the bad things that you don't want to have happen. <laughs> Just like take the file and put it down. If it starts to buckle, you know you've pushed too hard and you'll see it's actually a lot less pressure than you think. So we're finalizing up the rinse here. I did speed that up as well because no one needs to see me just run a bunch of, you know, triton through a tooth, but 
I did. So there you go. And we're going to start the drying process. I wasn't sure if we were actually able to get everything dry here. Every time we have a sinus that's really big like that, you run the risk of it, you know, still having some drainage after. And so what I would recommend in a case like that, if we weren't able to get it all the way dry, depends on the patient, how they're doing, how long you've spent. In this case, I was considering running the gentle wave if we weren't able to get all the way dry, because it could help me out here. But otherwise, I would, I would definitely just use calcium hydroxide, call it a day and bring it back in a month. There's nothing wrong with doing a two-step. We've talked about that many times before. If you need me to go over it again, let me know. So we will be doing the squirt technique for this one. When you have a squirt technique with a more open shape like that, you don't want to push too hard. You need to be gentle with the pack mac With the sinus being open like that, you can get a little more material out the apex than you'd like. So I'm not pushing nearly as hard. You can see I pulled back pretty quickly from the palatal. And when I do the down pack there, I'm not going as far. I might be going down about 12 millimeters on a 17 millimeter case. So really not doing a ton of apical pressure because how the squirt technique works, it uses the natural like pressure inside the body to offset the pressure of the gutta percha and sealer coming down. And if that pressure is not there, well, it's just going to send a bunch of crap out the apex, which is not what you want to have happen. Keep the sizes small here. That was one of the things I was able to do by not really over instrumenting these teeth and just make sure you don't push too hard. You can always go back in. If the initial fill is short, you can go back in with the pack mac You can go back in with a like heated instrument like the Alpha, repress down. Worst case scenario, you can take the whole gutta percha out, use a cone. So there are backups to it, but go in there and try it. The, the squirt technique is a really useful technique in a lot of these cases, and I'd highly recommend you all play with it. So any questions as always, drop a comment below. I'm always here to answer. But obturation on this one, pretty straightforward. As you can see, it is a little bit of a mess in there with the uh, with the sealer, but that's fine. This isn't for Instagram. This is YouTube. This is real life, not pretend. <laughs> I did just have a conversation about how I probably should be nicer to my Instagram colleagues, but we were making, uh, actually it was this video. If you look right behind the mirror, there's a tiny little hole that the assistant noticed when we started the case that there's this small little hole in the rubber dam and I made a joke of like oh if I was an Instagram dentist I'd have to take the rubber dam off now so that the picture looks absolutely perfect so anyway <laughs> it's not gonna affect the tooth you can see there's no leakage through the mouth it'll be okay and with that we are pretty much all done with the obturation just have to clean up that sealer here a little bit of isopropyl alcohol is gonna do that really nicely for us scrub 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 get all that out we will be doing the bonding here and the sealer can impact the bonds. You do want to make sure to remove that, rinse it all out, and it looks nice and clean. Now I am going to be going in with the pack mac here. As we talked about, I was able to keep the buccal canals nice and tiny, so I'm okay going down those. On the palatal, I really just did the very top part, right about down to where the plugger went to, just to make sure that that void would be sealed in. You do want to take it easy with the large cases like this, with the palatal being kind of just naturally more wide and not having that back pressure from the sinus. There is a chance that you could extrude material, which is a bad day for everybody involved. As you can see, we did have the gutta percha drop down really nicely with the pack mac which tells us that it did its job, it's compacting everything nicely. So we do need to come back in now with the beta, fill that space in, and just make sure everything looks nice and pretty. At this point, the obturation is pretty much done. There's not much else we have to do here. We'll be taking an x-ray in just a few moments to verify before we fill everything up that it looks great, and I will be doing the restorative here. Thankfully, this dentist is cool with me going in and getting everything nice and sealed up. And we'll talk about a couple things that I did differently here. So the x-ray looked great and we're going to be getting ready for the restorative aspect right now. I did leave a little bit of composite there. I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to finish it. And rather than take out all the deposit at the beginning, I decided to leave a little bit just in case we did have to temporize it with cavit. Makes it a little bit easier if you don't have this little lip here. But as we are going to be finishing it up, I'm going to go and remove that. I did leave that little area on the distal, kind of like where the marginal ridge would be, because this tooth is going to get a crown. There's no doubt that it needs a crown. It already has a crack on top of there. Want to protect it. And so leaving that isn't going to cause any issues because as soon as you go in for a crown, visualize it in your mind, we'd prep that out anyway and it would be gone. So not a big deal here. And this way I don't have to deal with putting bands or anything inside there. And we're going to go ahead and blast away everything. One cool thing with cracked teeth is the blasting powder can often show you if there's any residual cracks. They'll look really bright. Sometimes it'll actually get inside there. So thankfully everything looked good there. And we are going to 
gonna be doing a selective etch technique. I might have to switch up my etch. It does look a little runny, but as we talked about in my what, you know, what's changed video, that's one of the big things the botting process has changed. It, it updates all the time, so that's not surprising. And in here, I am gonna be just doing the phosphoric acid on the enamel. We'll be using the self-etch technique with our one-step universal from Clearfell. So scrub, 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 get that into all the areas. You wanna make sure it looks great. And you'll notice, you know, some of you might be asking, wait, why did you even go on to the enamel? You, you're prep is all in Denton. And this is also kind of cribbed from the BioClear people. But what you can do, because composite shrinks when it cures, especially the dual cure stuff, one of the cool things you can do is actually use this to your advantage. And so what I did here is I deliberately went up onto the enamel so I can get a nice strong enamel bond. Because when I come in with a composite itself, I'm going to be putting a little bit on there. Then when it light cures, it all kind of compacts down into the middle and helps to hold the tooth and prevent any future fractures, which is exactly what we want to do. This is also why I took it out of the bite at the beginning, is not just to make it so that they're not going to be accidentally biting down after. This gives me a little bit of restorative space. Now, it's only like a half a millimeter. I, I don't want this to last for you know years and years. The patient needs to go and get the crown, but this makes me feel a little more secure that every time they bite together, instead of the filling acting as a wedge and driving the tooth apart, because we've grabbed onto the enamel, it will continue to strengthen the tooth here, lower the risk for fractures. And this is something that the BioCode people will talk about if you've ever taken their course, highly recommend it. So at this point, we're just finishing up here. I'm just making sure we don't have leave any sharp spots. And the bite looked good. Small little spot that was touching. I still left it out of the bite. I don't want it to be hitting there. But by having the composite on the enamel, it helps me feel better that the tooth's going to have a good long-term prognosis until that crown is done. So here we are, final images. You can see that pretty looking MB2 there. Here's what the final composite looked like. I did make it look prettier than that. Don't worry, it's not that ugly. <laughs> and then the final image here, you can see nice little puffs, nice and conservative on the puckles. Anyway, hopefully this was a good one. I realize I haven't done as many clinical things lately, so I hope you enjoyed that. As always, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them below. And thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you all next time.